Well, let's go to the US now, where Dr. Anthony Fauci, the top pandemic advisor to both the Trump and Biden administrations, was grilled by a House panel investigating the origins of COVID. And boy, was it explosive. House Republicans interrogating Fauci about mask mandates, vaccines and the so-called science behind lockdowns did not hold back. Have a look at this exchange with Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Republican congresswoman from Georgia. Your science is displayed perfectly in this picture where children, children in school, were put in plastic bubbles because of your science, your repulsive, evil science. And let's go back to your very own email. You said earlier you don't use email. Oh, you do. Right here. This is your own email where you said the typical mask you buy in the drugstore is not really effective in keeping out virus. I do not recommend that you wear a mask. This is your email. This is your own words. Joining me now is former White House Press Secretary, Sean Spicer. Sean, welcome. Um, extraordinary scenes from that hearing. Most startling was that Fauci, who once described himself as the personification of science, admitted so many of the restrictions imposed on the American people uh, during the pandemic were not based on science at all. That's right. You just played part of that exchange with Marjorie Taylor Greene. And it was just one of several. I, I tell you, James, I think that we could eliminate our debt if we started charging to air some of these hearings because they become <laughs> must-see TV. But the, the reality is when asked about the six feet social distancing that became the norm here in the United States, he basically admitted we made it up. We didn't know better, 10 feet, three feet. We just picked a number and, and did it. And think about how that affected so many aspects of our life and society here, but particularly and this was a theme of the, the hearing, particularly with children. And I think, mm. frankly, the generational impact that it's gonna have. The thing that I found interesting is there was no remorse. It mm. literally was, well, you know, what did you think we were gonna do? And I, I just can't believe that you could be that arrogant as you were getting questioned. I Normally in a crisis, somebody admits a little, uh, will eat a little, what we say, humble pie, and admit that they made some mistakes, or hey, it was novel and we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, Fauci showed no remorse at all for any of these decisions that impacted our economy. And as I said, so many Americans, especially young Americans. What do you think will happen to Fauci as a result of these hearings and what should happen? Nothing. I mean, this is how it works over here. You get to do things like that. And then it's almost like the weatherman. Now, I don't know how you guys, you know, I've seen, I've been over in Australia enough times but I haven't necessarily paid attention to the weather in the morning. But here, you could make a forecast that can be totally wrong, and the next day you get up and just sort of say, well, it'll be sunny today, and da 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 There's no consequences for being right or wrong. I mean, Fauci's going to go on, live his life. I'm sure he'll get paid a ton of money to go to left-wing uh, organizations and give speeches. You saw today a very divided hearing, right? The Republicans were holding him to task, holding up his words, holding up emails, as you just played out from Marjorie Taylor Greene, and saying, this is what you said, you stand by it. The Democrats largely played up to him and talked about the sacrifices that he's made and all of the enduring co uh, contributions he's made to our society. So I think as long as Democrats have any kind of control, which they do control the Senate here in the United States, he's not going to face any kind of consequences. And in fact, he'll continue to be embraced by the left here as some kind of hero. All right. I, uh, I want to move on to the other big news, of course, in the U.S. today, and that's Hunter Biden's federal gun trial. Uh, it all kicked off today with jury selection. What can we expect from this? Well, look, I think there's two things that are important for every audience that, that's paying attention to this at all to understand. Number one, um, a lot of folks here in the U.S. keep saying, well, it's amazing how folks on the right are looking at this versus how they looked at Trump. Well, let's let's make sure everyone understands this. Hunter Biden was given a sweetheart deal. And, and he rejected it. He was, he was, they were trying to get him out of this deal. And that's important to understand because people are saying, oh, see, it's not a two tiered system of justice. The Biden Justice Department is equally going after Hunter, but they're only going after him because he rejected a sweetheart deal. This isn't like this is their first offer. The second thing that's important to understand, James, is every Democrat around here when there's a shooting talks about how we need to have stricter gun control, we need to know who's buying guns. Here's Hunter Biden who lied lied on a federal firearms application because he was a known addict. How do I know that? How do you know that? How does anyone know it? Because he wrote it in his own book. 
This isn't a, this is it should be a slam dunk case. He wrote about it in a book that he published talking about his struggles with addiction. That's unfortunately a very tough situation. I feel bad for him. But at the end of the day, you cannot have a firearm in the United States if you are addicted to drugs. And he admitted on the form that he wasn't. That's a lie. That's misleading the public. And it's something that Democrats rally against all the time. People falsifying applications to get to get firearms. And we need to be stricter and more controlling. It's amazing the silence here in the United States from the left, and I mean not just Democrats, but from the media, who love to talk about people who shouldn't have firearms in the United States. And in this particular case, not only was that firearm illegally obtained because he lied on a form, but then it was discarded in a trash can near a school. I cannot believe what a pass this is getting here in the U.S. from our left-wing media, but it shouldn't be surprised. So, Sean, the way you're speaking, it sounds to me like you don't really expect that uh, Hunter Biden's travails will impact on Joe Biden at all. Oh, my God. I mean, look, number one, it's the opposite of Trump. He's being tried in Delaware, a hugely Democratic state that supports the Biden family. has been in, in, in charge there for 50 years. Uh, I think he's got a really good chance of getting off, despite the fact that, like I said, it's literally in his book that he admits an addiction problem, which uh, easily... Uh, you know, shows that that he lied on the federal firearms application. But I, I think he's gonna. He, there's a good chance he gets off on this. Number one, and number two is you can see that the, this is all about trying to make him a victim here in the United States. He was addicted. He had a problem, and and we should feel bad for him. Joe Biden loves his son. This is all about creating a very very, um, uh, you know, favorable environment to to Hunter and and the trials and tribulations he's going through. And and and. In President Trump's case, right, it was follow the dots. You know, Michael Cohen did this, and there was some, but they were always trying to figure out we can't actually, we have nothing to prove. It goes back to Donald Trump. Here in Hunter Biden's case, there's no question about it. The evidence is there. Hunter himself admits to it. And yet, I do think he's got a good chance of getting off because it's in Delaware. Amazing. All right, quickly talk to me about the fallout from Trump's criminal conviction. I've got a couple of rapid fire questions for you on this. Firstly, how's it affecting his campaign? Well, look, he's raised over $70 million in the last, what, 72 hours, 96 hours. That's an unheard of, unprecedented number in politics. He raised over $140 million in the month of May. Any question about his ability to compete? But the big thing isn't just the dollars he raised, it's who's giving it. A lot of these people, a third of them, have never contributed before. So this is new people getting fired up and involved in this. I think the Democrats went way too far. And when you, one thing that you've got to keep in mind when looking at this race is we're talking about a handful of states, but even more so, it's a very, very minute number of people who are, quote, undecided in any of those states. What this has done more than anything else, James, is harden the, the support among Trump's base. These people might have been supporting him in the past. Now they want a yard sign. They want to knock on doors. They want to make phone calls. They want to make another contribution. This has strengthened the resolve of so many of Trump's supporters, and frankly, a lot of people who might not have been with him, but see the weaponization and the lawfare that's been used against him. Sean, one more question before we uh, finish. Sentencing is set to happen, I think, four days before the Republican National Convention. And I'm thinking, surely they wouldn't put Trump in jail. I mean, they, they wouldn't possibly do that, but there's an appetite for it. Have a listen to former FBI Director James Comey. They would just put him in a double wide somewhere out near the fence, out in the grass. And he would eat there, he'd shower there, he'd exercise there, he'd be away, as Donya Perry said, from general population. But it's obviously doable. Sean, they wouldn't put him in jail, would they? You know what, James? I didn't think that they would convict him. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I'm not holding my breath on anything anymore. I think Judge Marchand wants to be a hero. He obviously, through his contributions and through his daughter's activities, have made it very clear whose side he's on. Uh, in some ways, this is their opportunity to go down in history as someone who not only convicted, but then jailed the former president who the left hates. I, I would have answered this question no way, absolutely no way, a few weeks ago. And then as I've seen how this trial has progressed uh, and the verdict that ultimately was reached, I don't put anything past the left right now. But I'll tell you this, you're absolutely right. The sentencing is scheduled for July 11th. The convention kicks off on the 15th. If they do this, they will unequivocally guarantee the re-election of Donald Trump on November 5th of this year. So in some ways, I think, you know, the, the people are almost itching for it. I would hate to see President Trump 
actually have to go to jail, but in a weird way, it would almost certainly guarantee his return to the White House. Amazing times in the United States. Sean Spicer, thank you for your time. You bet.